HR's report delayed FEHB and private Roths all on today's Fedna Babble. Welcome to today's Fed and Babble. I'm Kevin Jones, where we we take uh, federal retirement benefits and make them understandable for people like you in under 20 minutes. And I'm Cassie Knight. We take your questions um, that you've submitted online and that Kevin gets from his um, workshops and webinars, and I get from financial advisors that are from employees, and we uh, answer them on the show and, um, you know, talk about them and just have a discussion. Let's, so what's the first question today, Kevin? First question is, will you share it? Sure. (laughs) Will you share? Subscribe and do all that good stuff. Okay. Question number one. (laughs) <laughs> is that is HR that... report different than the federal benefits statement? Now, yeah. the the HR report that they're talking so in this is this comes directly from the workshop. In the workshop, mm-hmm. I mention a different way to figure out if you're eligible or not, and it doesn't come through HR and the SCD. It comes through filling out a form that goes to OPM and OPM writes back with a report or, you know, they, they, they'll email you this report. (laughs) Okay. So they'll email you the report. Are you talking about the certified summary of service? That I am. Okay. Well, from what I get from this employee or from the question is the benefit statement and OPM's actual retirement um, report that they provide. That's right. I, I believe what, that. yeah, I believe what this person is saying is the federal benefits statement. Now, this is something that I mention in our workshops is that when someone comes up and says, okay, the federal benefits statement, the federal benefits statement to one, again, to one agency, maybe called something different to another agency, maybe called something different you may get it through HR or you may get it through HR website. It really depends. Mm -hmm. So it's all over the place. And here's the other thing. There's two separate types of reports. Yes. Right. You can get your employee benefit statement from, which is typically from HR. Right. And then you can get the um, OPM statement, which is like your retirement estimate. Right. Right. And so there's two separate reports and that's how I understood it is they were asking about the two different reports. <laughs> yes. And I do believe that's okay. what it is. Um, here, here's okay, the yeah. issue though, is that yeah. most people think that the federal benefit statement that they get from HR or whatever it's called when they get it from HR. Right. Is, is it, that is what they go off of mm. to try to retire. They don't know about the, the report that comes from OPM. Mm-hmm. Most federal employees don't have a clue that it actually exists. In fact, most HR people don't know that it exists. Oh, boy. Yeah, because they can have very different information. Right. Right. Like I see the employee statements and I see the HR uh, or the OPM retirement statements and the employee statements simply just have the employee information, right? The different SCDs, um, their current F, uh, Fegley and FEHB elections. Like it breaks all of that, all of that stuff down. Uh, it doesn't always get into the different types of service. It really depends on the, the employee benefit statement that the HR agency provides. Right. But then OPM is just showing um, the, the cost. It'll show your pension amount based on when you want to retire. And then obviously just the cost as of right now for your current benefits, most of the time, right? Sometimes it can also give different scenarios if somebody's like, well, I'm gonna cancel my Fagley. So they won't put the Fagley information right. on there. But that's the thing is they're just gonna put 
whatever you think that might be right. That doesn't mean that that's actually what you should be doing because they're not giving you any guidance. <laughs> right. And it also doesn't mean that um, that's what OPM is going to base your retirement off of. I remember talking to one lady right. who, when she got the report, and she did it before she came to the workshop, which was good because, hard, again, hardly any federal employee knows about this. And so right. she got it from OPM and she noticed that so early in her career, she worked in Turkey as a federal employee for seven years. OPM oh. had no record of it. Yeah. None. And, oh, right. wow. and, and she thought everything was just going to be fine, but didn't realize that her, mm. her, her pension and everything else would be based off seven less years. So she had to go back wow. and get all the documentation and try to prove that she had worked in Turkey for seven years. Wow. Yeah. You know, and I see that all the time when people submit, uh, when they are, when our advisors submit the information for me to build their reports for their federal employees, of course, I ask them to include any other documentation regarding um, an employee's, um, employee's history, right? Whether that's the HR estimate, whether it's their employee benefit statement, like all of that information right. can sometimes have other information that I need to make sure that uh, the information we're getting back to or the report that we're getting back to the employee is accurate, right? But so many times I have seen where the advisor is gathering more information or uh, more accurate information than what the HR statement is saying, yep. right? Because they'll have like, oh yeah, I made my deposit for my four years of military, military time, but then the OPM retirement statement doesn't even show the military service included in there at all. Right. And so, you know, it people think that that is because it's from OPM, that it is the most accurate statement. I mean, if you worked part time and they don't have that factor in there, that could be something that's, you know, hinders you the other way. And so um, it's very, very important to just have that looked at by somebody um, and, you know, make sure that it's actually good to go because we want to correct those things before retirement, right? As early as we right. can. So that way people have the time to get that corrected. Um, because I've seen all too often as well with uh, financial advisors where they're like, hey, this employee had to delay retirement or it delays the finalization of their pension amount or of the retirement application with OPM. And so obviously they're not receiving their full pension amount um, because they have to go back and correct these these issues um, or, or discrepancies in their service or mm -hmm. there's discrepancies in, you know, their deduction amount or their paycheck or whatever it is. Um, it's just, there's so many different factors that can play a role in, uh, you know, making sure that the information that you have is solid. And, you know, that's why we strongly encourage all the time for employees, make sure you get your SF50s, make sure that you're gathering um, you know, different documentation that you need to get a hold of, you know, way before retirement, at least five years before yes. retirement. Um, yeah. Get that certified summary. Make sure that all of your um, service history is listed on there properly because if there's any discrepancies, again, you've got to figure that out and, you know, yeah. prove to your department or OPM or whoever to make sure that that's taken care of. Um, you know, before, before it delays something. Yeah. <laughs> like I remember one, one, one gentleman, he came in and he said, I got this report three years ago. There was a mistake on it and I'm still battling it. I'm still wow. fighting it three years later. So yeah. it's a real thing. It, it has to be done or OPM will figure out what your retirement is based on wrong numbers. No yep. one wants to be in that situation. So no. In fact, my uncle, real quick, yeah, he had military service that um, for some reason didn't get mm. recorded properly, and he has been fighting for I want to say two years ish, maybe longer. But he's about at the point where he is going to have to write Congress about it because. 
there is absolutely no record Yikes. from the service he had done for a stint of period, a, a stint of time in the military. I mean, it's not on his DD-214, and so then it doesn't get over to his federal service. He wants to make the deposit for it, and he obviously can't because there's no record right. of the single time right. or how much you need, right? And all of the different factors that go into that. And he, I mean, he's been working on this for a number of years. And I mean, luckily, he's always off until retirement. But could you imagine if he was retiring this year or trying to? That's like right. he still wouldn't be able to because he has to, you know, go through all of these hoops and do all of these things to make sure that that's taken care of. That's so very, oh. very important. Yeah. Ugh. Yikes. Okay. Question number two. Oh, this is a long one. If you have health care benefits yeah. five years prior to retirement, okay, so fulfilling the five year thing, and that's good, but yeah. do not need to use the benefits immediately because you can be covered by a spouse, can you take that benefit later in retirement when needed? It sounds like what they're asking is, can I put off using the benefit? Can I suspend it? I believe that's what they're saying. Okay. Yeah, and I'm gonna say it depends, right? <laughs> so Doesn't it always? <laughs> always. So what type of health care does that employee have right like the, not the federal employee but the employee spouse rather um do they have tricare and chapel coverage or yeah. are you looking at going on uh you know their employer sponsored program like what does that look like because essentially it boils down to two things there are only two reasons why you can suspend coverage in retirement okay one is for tricare and chapel coverage the other one is if you're getting into a Medicare Advantage type plan. Right. Okay. Not original Medicare, not a Medicare supplement, but the, essentially that's why you can suspend your FEHB coverage. Otherwise, you need to stay in the program because you don't want to get to the point where you're canceled because you thought you would be able to jump back in, but you actually can't. Then, hey, don't laugh. This happens. I, I know it does. I know. In, you know. Now, if they're a federal employee couple, that's a different scenario. Yep. yep. Right? That's a premium that conversion strategy where you can jump from, you know, if a federal employee spouse um, still working and the, the federal employee is going to retire, then yes, they can hop onto that federal employee spouse's FEHB and make them primary and then come back later um, to the other one. That's fine. Right. Um, actually... And working with an advisor right now who's um there's a federal employee couple one is going to be retiring from service um i want to say this year or next year the other one is separating from service but they're not going to separate from service for another few years right so but they're just separating they're not actually retiring mm -hmm. from service they won't qualify because their age is won't be there Okay. So the federal employee is going to retire. And at that time, well, actually the year before they retire. So I think this open season, they'll be shifting to the employee spouses, FEHB. Mm -hmm. So that way they're paying for FEHB pre-tax. Right. Good. And then the year before that federal employee spouse will be separating from service then they're going to go back and get on to the um, retired federal employees FEHB. So that way they can continue it and not have any time without FEHB coverage and not have it canceled. Because once it's canceled, you can't get back in out. once right. you've retired. Right. So it's very key to strategize this properly and just make sure that you make the um, uh, changes to FEHB during the open season because retirement or separating from service does not count as a qualifying life event. Right. To be able to make well, those many changes. people think it, it does. Mm -hmm. I get that question all the time. And people are disappointed when they find out, no, it doesn't. Uh, I hate to say it, but no. Yeah. yeah. Okay. 
Very good. Okay, that's question two. Question three. Can you have a private Roth and a TSP Roth? Um, so really the answer is yes. Yeah. Unless I, I can't think of a, it depends here, but it's just a plain old yes. So you can save up to what? 19,500 in yeah. your TSP Roth plus put another, what is it? 7,500 in a regular Roth IRA. Is that what it is? At least um, this year. Yeah, for 2020. Yeah. Um, and it's actually 6,500. 6, um, yeah. For the, the max that a person, if they're over the age of 50, then they can okay. make those extra con contributions. <clears throat> Is it less than 50? Then obviously they can't do that. Um, well, that's the catch up uh, contribution you're talking about, right? Yes. Okay. Because I'm the only contributors. Go ahead. Okay, they can only contribute nineteen thousand five hundred dollars maximum for twenty twenty. Right. If they are over the fifty, then they can do the catch up contributions of the extra sixty five hundred. Right, sixty five hundred, but then mm -hmm. they can put another sixty five hundred into a IRA Roth, a Roth IRA. Not sure about that. You can. Can you? Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So essentially, though. Whether or not it's worth it for an employee to have both TSP Roth and a, a private life or private Roth is not something obviously that we can say that that is in your best interest. Right. right? <laughs> that and, and definitely needs to be with, with a financial advisor. Yeah, that's that's the thing I hear all the time. Oh, you can. Okay, I'm going to go do that. And I have to stop people and say, mm -hmm. wait a minute, that may be a horrible idea for you. But the guy sitting next to you, it may be a great idea. So you can't just go and decide to do it just because you can doesn't mean that you ought to do it. And we have to be very, very careful. As we start making moves like this, we hear, oh, that's, you know, people can listen to this uh, to, to this podcast and watch a show and, and pick up something new and think, oh, I've got to go do that. Don't. We're not saying to go do it. We're right. saying that you have to go, you should go visit someone and see if it's in, like you said, if it's in your best interest to make it happen. Yeah. Everybody's situation is different. Everybody's got different things to think about um, in their financial picture. And this is just one piece of the puzzle that you've got to figure out how it all fits together. Right. Yeah. So as a federal employee, they're very lucky to have all <clears throat> these different pieces to be able to put together. Right. Because, I mean, everybody has to think about these things, but they actually have more tools and resources and benefits to be able to put together to make a solid financial plan. Um, but that's the thing is you've got to know how to put it together. Otherwise, you can really screw yourself right. <laughs> in retirement. And that's yep. what we don't want. Right. That's why we're that's why we have this show. We want to bring awareness to federal employees and encourage them to take action right? Take responsibility of your retirement because it's not just going to happen automatically. Um, these are definitely things that, that you need to think about and, and talk with somebody about. And, um, you know, if you don't have a, an advisor or a financial advisor that you feel comfortable with, or you're just not sure, you want to make sure that you have somebody um, who's a, uh, who's versed in the federal benefits, then let us know. Uh, go to fennelbattle.com, like, uh, subscribe, share, all of those different things. But more importantly, fill out some information, right? Give, uh, put your information in. Let us build that report for you. We'll get you connected to a financial advisor in your area or um, at least that's versed in the federal benefits. So that way you know that they're going to help you build a solid financial plan. Because we've got these, these advisors, we're making sure that they're going to build comprehensive financial plans with you. Um, they're not just after your TSP or the life insurance or anything else, right? They want to make sure that all of these different pieces of your benefits are put together correctly for your financial goals. Um, and yeah. yeah. So I would say overall, and you brought up a good point. They're not after anything. They, I mean, the people that we work with, I mean, there, there may be others. I don't, I, I mean, 
I know that there are others and I don't want to lay blame or anything like that. But you and I, right. we work with kind of the cream of the crop. Those who are out for the best interest of the federal employee instead. And of course, if if you've heard something today and need some more information about something and want to ask a follow-up question, you can also go to fedandbabble.com. And as always, if you'd like to, please, we highly recommend that you subscribe to the podcast that you, or, well, or to the show on YouTube, Facebook, whatever it is, and uh, like it and share this with your friends if you would. And besides that, any other words of wisdom from you, Cassie? Um, yeah, don't forget to submit a question, right? Go to foundablebible.com and, and let us know what you have questions about because that way we can answer it here. Um, and obviously if we use that, then of course you get Fenobabble, um t-shirts or face mask or something like that. So Great. spread the word. All Bye. Right. Bye.